This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Twenty Years After by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 8 How D'Artagnan, on going to a distance to discover Aramis, discovers his old friend on horseback behind his own planchette. On entering the hotel, D'Artagnan saw a man sitting in a corner by the fire. It was Planchette, but so completely transformed thanks to the old clothes that the departing husband had left behind, that D'Artagnan himself could hardly recognize him. Madeleine introduced him in the presence of all the servants. Planchette addressed the officer with a fine Flemish phrase. The officer replied in words that belonged to no language at all, and the bargain was concluded. Madeleine's brother entered D'Artagnan's service. The plan adopted by D'Artagnan was soon perfected. He resolved not to reach Noisy in the day, for fear of being recognized. He had, therefore, plenty of time before him, for Noisy is only three or four leagues from Paris, on the road to Meur. He began his day by breakfasting substantially, a bad beginning when one wants to employ the head, but an excellent precaution when one wants to work the body, and about two o'clock he had his two horses saddled, and followed by Planchette, he quitted Paris by the Barrière de la Villette. A most active search was still prosecuted in the house near the Hôtel de la Chevrette for the discovery of Planchette. At about a league and a half from the city, D'Artagnan, finding that in his impatience he had set out too soon, stopped to give the horses breathing time. The inn was full of disreputable-looking people, who seemed as if they were on the point of commencing some nightly expedition. A man, wrapped in a cloak, appeared at his door, but seeing a stranger he beckoned to his companions, and two men who were drinking in the inn went out to speak to him. D'Artagnan, on his side, went up to the landlady, praised her wine, which was a horrible production from the country of Montreuil and heard from her that there were only two houses of importance in the village. One of these belonged to the Archbishop of Paris, and was at that time the abode of his niece, the Duchess of Longueville. The other was a convent of Jesuits, and was the property, a by no means unusual circumstance, of these worthy fathers. At four o'clock D'Artagnan recommenced his journey. He proceeded slowly, and in deep reverie. Planchette also was lost in thought, but the subject of their reflections was not the same. One word which their landlady had pronounced had given a particular turn to D'Artagnan's deliberations. This was the name of Madame de Longueville. That name was indeed one to inspire imagination and produce thought. Madame de Longueville was one of the highest ladies in the realm. She was also one of the greatest beauties at court. She had formerly been suspected of an intimacy of too tender a nature with Coligny, who for her sake had been killed in a duel in the Place Royale by the Duc de Guise. She was now connected by bonds of a political nature with the Prince de Marcelac, the eldest son of the old Duc de Rochefoucauld, whom she was trying to inspire with an enmity toward the Duc de Conde, her brother-in-law, whom she now hated mortally. D'Artagnan thought of all these matters. He remembered how, at the Louvre, he had often seen, as she passed by him in the full radiance of her dazzling charms, the beautiful Madame de Longueville. He thought of Aramis, who, without possessing any greater advantages than himself, had formerly been the lover of Madame de Chevreau, who had been to a former court what Madame de Longueville was in that day, and he wondered how it was that there should be in the world people who succeed in every wish, some in ambition, others in love, whilst others, either from chance or from ill luck, or from some natural defect or impediment, remain halfway upon the road toward fulfilment of their hopes and expectations. He was confessing to himself that he belonged to the latter unhappy class, when Planchette approached and said, "'I will lay a wager, your honour, that you and I are thinking of the same thing.' "'I doubt it, Planchette,' replied D'Artagnan. "'But what are you thinking of?' "'I am thinking, sir, of those desperate-looking men who were drinking in the inn where we rested.' "'Always cautious, Planchette. It is instinct, your honour. "'Well, what does your instinct tell you now?' "'Sir, my instinct told me that those people were assembled there for some bad purpose, and I was reflecting on what my instinct had told me in the darkest corner of the stable, when a man wrapped in a cloak and followed by two other men came in.' "'Aha!' said D'Artagnan, Planchette's recital agreeing with his own observations. "'Well?' One of these two men said, "'He must certainly be at Noisy, or be coming there this evening, for I have seen his servant.' "'Art thou sure?' said the man in the cloak. "'Yes, my prince.' "'My prince?' 
interrupted D'Artagnan. "'Yes, my prince. But listen. If he is here,' this is what the other man said, "'let's see decidedly what to do with him.' "'What to do with him?' answered the prince. "'Yes, he's not a man to allow himself to be taken, anyhow. He'll defend himself.' "'Well, we must try to take him alive. Have you cords to bind him with, and a gag to stop his mouth?' "'We have. Remember that he will most likely be disguised as a horseman.' "'Yes, yes, my lord, don't be uneasy. Besides, I shall be there. You will assure us that justice—' "'Yes, yes, I answer for all that,' the prince said. "'Well, then, we'll do our best. Having said that, they went out of the stable.' "'Well, what matters all that to us?' said D'Artagnan. "'This is one of those attempts that happen every day.' "'Are you sure that we are not its objects?' "'We? Why?' "'Just remember what they said. "'I have seen his servants,' said one. "'That applies very well to me.' "'Well? "'He must certainly be at Noisy or coming up there this evening,' said the other. "'And that applies very well to you.' "'What else?' Then the prince said, "'Take notice that in all probability he will be disguised as a cavalier, which seems to me to leave no room for doubt, since you are dressed as a cavalier and not as an officer of the musketeers. Now then, what do you say to that?' "'Alas, my dear Planchette,' said D'Artagnan, sighing, "'we are unfortunately no longer in those times in which princes would care to assassinate me. Those were the good old days. Never fear, these people owe us no grudge.' "'Is your honour sure?' I can answer for it if they do not. Well, we won't speak of it any more, then, said Planchette, and he took his place in D'Artagnan's suite with that sublime confidence he had always had in his master, which even fifteen years of separation had not destroyed. They had travelled onward about half a mile when Planchette came close up to D'Artagnan. Stop, sir, look yonder, he whispered. Don't you see in the darkness something pass by like shadows? I fancy I hear horses' feet. Impossible, returned D'Artagnan. The ground is soaking wet. Yet I fancy, as thou sayest, that I see something. At this moment the neighing of a horse struck his ear, coming through darkness and space. There are men somewhere about. But that's of no consequence to us, said D'Artagnan. Let us ride onward. At about half-past eight o'clock they reached the first houses in Noisy. Every one was in bed, and not a light was to be seen in the village. The obscurity was broken only now and then by the still darker lines of the roofs of houses. Here and there a dog barked behind a door, or an affrighted cat fled precipitately from the mists of the pavement to take refuge behind a pile of faggots, from which retreat her eyes would shine like peridors. These were the only living creatures that seemed to inhabit the village. Toward the middle of the town, commanding the principal open space, rose a dark mass, separated from the rest of the world by two lanes, and overshadowed in the front by enormous lime-trees. D'Artagnan looked attentively at the building. This, he said to Planchette, must be the archbishop's chateau, the abode of the fair Madame de Longueville. But the convent, where is that? The convent, your honour, is at the other end of the village. I know it well. Well, then, Planchette, gallop up to it, whilst I tighten my horse's girth, and come back and tell me if there is a light in any of the Jesuits' windows. In about five minutes Planchette returned. Sir, he said, there is one window of the convent lighted up. Hm! If I were a frondeur, said D'Artagnan, I should knock here, and be assured of a good supper. If I were a monk, I should knock yonder, and should have a good supper there too. Whereas it is very possible that between the castle and the convent we shall sleep on hard beds, dying of hunger and thirst. Yes, added Planchette, like the famous ass of Buridan. Shall I knock? Hush! replied D'Artagnan. The light no longer burns in yonder window. "'Do you hear nothing?' whispered Planchette. "'What is that noise?' There came a sound like a whirlwind. At the same time, two troops of horsemen, each composed of ten men, sallied forth from each of the lanes which encompassed the house, and surrounded D'Artagnan and Planchette. "'Heyday!' cried D'Artagnan, drawing his sword and taking refuge behind the horses. "'Are you not mistaken?' Is it really for us that you mean your attack? Here he is, we have him, cried the horseman, rushing on D'Artagnan with naked swords. Don't let him escape, said a loud voice. No, my lord, be assured we shall not. D'Artagnan thought it was now time for him to join in the conversation. Hallo, gentlemen, he called out in his Gascon accent. What do you want? What do you demand? That thou shalt soon know, shouted a chorus of horsemen. Stop, stop, cried he, whom they had addressed as my lord. 
It is not his voice. Ah, just so, gentlemen. Pray, do people get in a passion at random at Noisy? Take care, for I warn you that the first man that comes within the length of my sword, and my sword is long, I rip him up. The chieftain of the party drew near. What are you doing here? he asked in a lofty tone, as that of one accustomed to command. And you? What are you doing here? replied D'Artagnan. Be civil, or I shall beat you, for although one may not choose to proclaim oneself, one insists on respect suitable to one's rank. You don't choose to discover yourself because you are the leader of an ambuscade, returned D'Artagnan. But with regard to myself, who am travelling quietly with my own servant, I have not the same reasons as you have to conceal my name. Enough, enough. What is your name? I shall tell you my name, in order that you may know where to find me, my lord or my prince, as it may suit you to be called, said our Gascon, who did not choose to seem to yield to a threat. Do you know Monsieur d'Artagnan? Lieutenant in the King's Musketeers, said the voice. You are Monsieur d'Artagnan? I am. Then you came here to defend him? Him? Who? The man we are seeking. It seems, said d'Artagnan, that whilst I thought I was coming to Noisy, I have entered, without suspecting it, into the kingdom of mysteries. Come, replied the same lofty tone, answer. Are you waiting for him underneath these windows? Did you come to Noisy to defend him? I am waiting for no one, replied d'Artagnan, who was beginning to be angry. I propose to defend no one but myself, and I shall defend myself vigorously, I give you warning. Very well, said the voice. Go away from here, and leave the place to us. Go away from here, said d'Artagnan, whose purposes were in conflict with that order. That is not so easy, since I am on the point of falling, and my horse, too, through fatigue, unless, indeed, you are disposed to offer me a supper and a bed in the neighborhood. Rascal! Eh, monsieur, said d'Artagnan, I beg you will have a care what you say, for if you utter another word like that, be you marquis, duke, prince, or king, I will thrust it down your throat. Do you hear? Well, well, rejoined the leader. There is no doubt tis a Gascon who is speaking, and therefore not the man we are looking for. Our blow has failed for to-night. Let us withdraw. We shall meet again, Master d'Artagnan, continued the leader, raising his voice. Yes, but never with the same advantages, said d'Artagnan, in a tone of raillery, for when you meet me again you will perhaps be alone, and there will be daylight. Very good, very good, said the voice. En route, gentlemen. And the troop, grumbling angrily, disappeared into the darkness, and took the road to Paris. D'Artagnan and Planchette remained for some moments still on the defensive. Then, as the noise of the horsemen became more and more distant, they sheathed their swords. "'Thou seest, simpleton,' said D'Artagnan to his servant, "'that they wish to do no harm to us.' "'But to whom, then?' "'In faith I neither know nor care. What I do care for now is to make my way into the Jesuits' convent. So to horse, and let us knock at their door. Happen what will, the devil take them, they can't eat us.' And he mounted his horse. Tanchette had just done the same, when an unexpected weight fell upon the back of the horse, which sank down. "'Hey, Your Honour!' cried Planchette. "'I have a man behind me.' D'Artagnan turned around, and saw plainly two human forms on Planchette's horse. "'Tis the devil, then, that pursues us,' he cried, drawing his sword, and preparing to attack the new foe. "'No, no, dear D'Artagnan,' said the figure. "'Tis not the devil. Tis Aramis. Gallop fast, Planchette, and when you come to the end of the village, turn swiftly to the left. And Planchette, with Aramis behind him, set off at full gallop, followed by D'Artagnan, who began to think he was in the merry maze of some fantastic dream. End of chapter 8